Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today on the data-driven legal practice, fact, fiction, or fantasy. Uh, the question for us today is really to, I guess, discuss whether or not it's possible to create a data-driven driven legal practice. Um, I'm Terry Modisette, the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law, and I'm going to be exploring the answer to that question with this amazing panel of data gurus, David Addison, the Head of Innovation and a Senior Lawyer at Aptum Legal, uh, Denise Doyle, Legal Operations Consultant, and Matt Farrington, who's a lawyer and legal technologist at Juno Legal. So welcome, everyone. Lovely to have you here. Let's jump straight in. And I, and I wanted to kick off, if I may, firstly, with um, getting each of our panellists to chat a little bit about themselves and particularly how um, they have basically come to be acquainted with data, how they use it, how they apply it uh, in the roles that they do every day. And Denise, um, you're the, the lucky one to kick us off with a response to that question. So hi, welcome, and let's hear about you. <laughs> hi, Jerry. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I have been in the transformation space for 22 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, and starting my journey in, in, uh, in Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma and quality or transformation, data was a huge part of that. And mm -hmm. my passion for data started when I was responsible at Citibank for the customer satisfaction survey. And I used to get the pleasure of getting the results every quarter and, and trolling through that data. And then that has just followed me to each role. And landing in legal ops in 2018 was a big um, eye opener for me coming from the financial services industry um, that data was not as prevalent as it was in the banks. And um, so I continued that fascination when I joined Telstra did quite a bit of work collecting data around uh, what they did and how they did things. Uh, and then that was able to inform our um, transformation journey or, or tech roadmap. And then I've just continued that through uh, each of the areas that I go to using data and metrics to help make decisions, to understand where roadblocks and process improvement can be, how we can address or um, meet strategic objectives um, and just having that passion, I also did uh, a research fellowship with the, the College of Law Centre for Legal Innovation, which was all around data. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you again for that fellowship, which was um, amazing. Matt, how about you? What's, uh, what's your connection with data? Uh, thanks, Terry. I'm a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so I, uh, my, my standard spiel on this is I had terrible career advice, uh, wound up in law school, should have been a data scientist, possibly a software developer, maybe even an engineer. Um, and I've always sort of had a, a passion and an interest in data. Um, and as my legal, but, but didn't work with it. And as my legal career has gone on, I've transitioned more and more from, um, uh, currently I do a lot of IT law, but that's transitioned more and more into legal tech legal operations and, and, and data. And, and I guess my probably formative experience as a, as a lawyer with data was um, worked for a big law firm. I was the first lawyer in a decade to ask for, can I have the Google Analytics for the website, please? <laughs> um, marketing just about fell off their chair because they said, we've been trying to shove this down partners' throats for years. Um, and I took great delight in pointing out that the partner I reported to, who's actually uh, known around the Centre for Legal Innovation was the most common exit point. And he was horrified that, what, do people not like my photo? Why are they leaving, why are they leaving my page? And, but to be able to point out to him was actually, they're looking for your phone number, they've found what they're looking for and they're, and they're moving on to the next thing. And so from there, really realised that, look, I was good at, I was good at this and I could understand what the data meant and look for more and more opportunities to bring that into both my practice as a lawyer but then also my work as a as a legal technologist and a legal operations person. It, it's a fascinating journey, though, Matt. Really, and how you know data has been that that kind of almost loop or common thread through that. So uh, great to hear. And David, um, last but certainly not least, um, what's your connection with data? Thanks, Terry. Um, first, thanks for the the CLI for hosting and for inviting me today. It's my first CLI webinar, Yay! so we'll see after this if I get. <laughs> Um, 
so I suppose my journey with data um, kind of grew out of my journey into the innovation sphere um, in law. I suppose I think I probably got the same advice as Matt early on and originally went to law school um, and originally went into to legal practice. So my um, background is, is, is a commercial litigator. Um, so I went to law school, then worked at um, one of the large firms here in Australia, purely in their litigation practice. Um, and then in about 2018, the firm I'm currently at, Aptum Legal, um, was being started by our founder, Nigel. Um, and I had the pleasure of being able to join him along on that journey. Um, started out as the, the, the only employee. So I was the, the senior lawyer, the junior lawyer, the receptionist, the IT guy. Um, and that developed into my, my current role as, as head of innovation at Aptum, which is um, broadly responsible for our systems, processes, et cetera. And also because I've, I think because I've been around the longest, um, also involved in the, the general management of the firm. So I suppose my, um, my, my data life or how I use data is kind of split along the various different roles that I've got. Um, so as head of innovation, I'm the one that's responsible for the data that we collect, um, what we use that for, how it's presented and, and making sure that the team has the information they need. So kind of the, the, the data architect. And then in my um, management role and in my senior lawyer role, I'm more of a consumer of the data in terms of what can I get out of this to, to help in our, in our litigation practice? What can I get out of this to help in you know, making our team more effective um, and those sorts of things. So um, I, I think it, it all, all originally came out of working in litigation and starting to tinker around with things like Excel and when being presented with huge data sets that someone needed to be um, make sense of. So they gave it to the junior lawyer um, and it's just kind of uh, gone on from there. Fantastic. That's great because, you know, the combination of your skill sets are really, you're looking at data from a business perspective, but also looking at it very much from the client's perspective and a matter perspective as mm -hmm. well. So that'll be really, really great to kind of get into. David, I'm going to stay with you, but I'm going to ask you initially, but also come to you, Matt and Denise, about this as well, um, about your reaction to a statement I'm going to read to you. Um, and no doubt, given your background, each of you might have a slightly different take on this, but, but let me read you the statement first. Legal organisations are still all about the mechanics of the process of collecting data rather than the value of the data itself. So, David, what does that mean to you and what do you think about that statement? Um, thanks, Harry. I'm, I'm going to give you... I said I'm a lawyer. I'm going to give you a very lawyer answer. <laughs> um, and in terms of whether I agree, I, I both agree and disagree. <laughs> and I'm going to caveat by saying, obviously, there's going to be a lot of generalisation. These <laughs> there's some areas of um, particularly litigation practice that are much, that use this sort of stuff much more. There are some businesses that um, are much better along this as well. But I, I suppose ultimately, statement of. Um, being all about the, the collection process rather than the value of the data itself. And I suppose when I say I both agree and disagree, um, in terms of, I suppose, the more macro uses of data, I suppose that's where I disagree in terms of the um, focusing on, say, for litigation, a particular proceeding. Um, lawyers are all about information in, information out, or information in, filtering it, restructuring it, information out. And when it comes to um, like that really micro purpose of this is the particular pro project I've got, this is the particular need I've got, uh, I think lawyers are very good at being, unless they're discovering to the other side and trying to bury them in paper, they're very good at thinking about the value first in terms of what, what, what's the problem I need to solve, what do I need to do it, and then going away and collecting the information. So on that micro level, um, I, I think it probably is more value. Um, on the... I suppose more macro level when we're starting to look at large data sets um, and, and not necessarily for an individual project, I, I, I think I, I agree in terms of um, a lot of process in terms of hoovering up a lot of information and not a lot going into the value that we can get from that information. Um, and I should say in terms of the, the, the collecting all that sort of information, I don't think it's necessarily a conscious thing. I think it's um, particularly law firms, but legal organisations collect a huge amount of data. Um, 
completely completely unconsciously from the what they what what value could be pulled out of that from a macro level. Um, so say for example, um, talk, uh, taking a broad definition of legal organisations, looking at the cost courts, for example, they pull in a huge amount of data in terms of legal costs and, and deploy it for a micro purpose in terms of what are the costs for this matter and what's going to be the payment for it. But that's a, a, a treasure trove of information that could be quite easily converted into something very valuable, i.e. in these types of matters or in typically at the Supreme Court, this is the cost profile and or this is what's claimed, this is what, what's out of it. And that that sort of could generate a lot of value out of that. So I suppose, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in, in terms of for lawyers, direct day-to-day direct -day business, the project that I've got sitting in front of me, excellent at, at focusing on the value, um, but not necessarily in terms of the, I suppose, less immediate business cases for, for the information that we're gathering. Yeah, fabulous. Matt, what about you? What are your thoughts about that? Is it is it still kind of more focused on on process than it is almost on, I guess, an analysis in order to pull out the value? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so, so look, I'll I'll be a bit controversial, provocative. <laughs> um, uh, I could make the vast majority of lawyers very happy by saying. Um, uh, here's an AI tool to record your time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, you don't have to do timesheets anymore because that is sort of the beginning, the middle, and the end mm -hmm. of of a of you know most lawyers' touch points with data. There aren't that many professions where you, that are generating that much data, like tracking time down to the six minute unit. That is a rich universe of data that could be mined for. How do you optimize? Where am I spending my time? Is it on the right thing? Is it on the wrong thing? I need to hire someone with this skill set. That person's overperforming. That one's underperforming. Is reduced down to have you made your billables target? And here is a bill to the client. And so I don't even know that a lot of firms are focusing on the process of collecting data. They're just doing what they've done because they've always done it. Mm. And even in possibly slightly less provocative spaces, um, Lawyers will write articles for their website. Lawyers will write newsletters to send to their clients. Uh, In-house legal teams will fill out long and detailed traffic light or red, amber, green reports, you know, describing the things they've always done. And if ultimately push came to shove, you ask people why, why they were doing this, it's often because, well, we always have, mm. or that's just what we do, or, well, that's what all the other firms do, without necessarily looking at, was well, anyone reading this? It's taking you a lot of time to put this together. Is it actually fit for the audience that which it's intended to? And I put all those things in that category. Um, I've seen some beautifully elaborate lawyer websites, lawyer reports, um, lawyer newsletters that literally no one, no one looks at. And you can go and get the, the data analytics to prove it. Mm. Um, and, and so definitely, I think... Um, Unlocking the value of the data you've already got would be a good first step. Um, and then from there, you know, you unlock a lot of possibilities to follow. So, so I think, yes, provocatively, I think I'll agree with the statement. And I would say most lawyers aren't probably even doing a lot of work on the process. They're just mm. doing it because they've always done it. Is it also, Matt, quick follow-up question on that before I come to you, Denise, but is it also about a lack of knowledge or understanding of what the value of that data could be? Um, it, it might be, but I suspect, well, my instinct would be probably a lot of data, and, and we'll come to this a little bit more about how you, how you start, but a lot of data is actually just common sense. Like you don't actually mm. need um, a, a degree in data science to, to unlock at least some of the basic information there. Um, step one is knowing to ask for it. And I almost guarantee, you know, if, if people aren't already doing this, whoever your IT person is or your web host will have Google Analytics installed on your website. It's free. You just need to ask for it to get it. Um, similar things with, with, you know, newsletters. For in-house teams writing reports for various people, you know, go and ask the people you give it to, mm. do you actually read this? So I think that that first step but then I'd also say uh, a lot of lawyers are far too busy 
to um, find the time to save some time. Um, yeah. You know, am I doing the right work? Oh no, I'm I'm far too busy doing it to figure figure that out. Hmm. Denise, I know this is near and dear, so I'm going to ask you the same question, but perhaps slightly differently. What are we missing out on by not unlocking, I guess, the more holistic version, if if you like, of connecting all the dots in terms of the data? Um, what don't we know in law firms as a result of that? And I know you've worked uh, in places that can well inform your thoughts about that. So... What are your thoughts? But but also, by all means, tell me what you think about the statement as well. Okay. I actually agree with the statement. I think that um, with the introduction of legal technology, organizations are capturing massive amounts of data. Um, do they value um, the insights of that data? Probably in varying degrees they do. Mm. Um, some organizations are more uh, advanced than others in their thinking. So you have GCs that really want to understand the information that they can get to support their businesses. And same in, in firms, you have some firms that are using data, you know, daily to, to drive decision making. So I think in, in varying degrees, but lawyers are so busy and focused on their work. And unless you have a, a legal ops person or a data person or a legal technologist that can actually start to make sense of your data, it could probably be quite overwhelming to, to an individual. And if gaining insights from that data is not a priority for that organization, giving someone that role is, would probably be a, a part-time to their full-time job. Yeah. And then, so you're, they're probably not given the opportunity to fully jump in and, and understand the data. Mm. So I do agree. And sorry, what was the sec? The this? Could you just repeat your second question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll just read the statement to you again. Legal organisations are still all about the mechanics of the process of collecting data rather than the value of that data itself. Yeah, it was the second part, though. The the, the lead into your question that I. Oh, the, the holistic part. I mean, yes. if, if, if we're kind of looking at it in pieces, which I think is, you know, in part what David and Matt were somewhat alluding to, um, are we missing out on a picture that is more holistic when all of those pieces are put together? And does that have a value in and of itself as well? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, I definitely think that if organisations could come up with a holistic view of their data, they'd be able to make, you know, data-driven decisions that would enable them to um, measure their performance. So for example, if they wanted to use data to find ways to uh, improve productivity, they could use that type of data. You might want to pull out matter data to see where the most amount of time your lawyers are spending on which matters and are they profitable or not. That might be one way that they could use the data to drive. Um, and then that would then fall into what, that would then lead into decisions around who do we recruit? What type of capabilities do we need? And then those decisions could then lead into their financial spend. You know, are we spending, you know, are we putting money in the right place? or are we getting the best value? So I think from a holistic view, whether you're in an in-house team or you're in a, in a firm, you could definitely gain heaps amount of value from looking at your data in a holistic way from you know the using data to determine the value chain of, of your processes and how you manage your business so i would definitely think that that is something that um we're missing out that, that legal is missing out on matt to pick up on something that you were saying um earlier and something that all of you again have kind of alluded to the, the amount of data that we're, we're producing in any legal business has never been a problem. We've got loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of it. Um, and, and, and it can probably feel a little bit overwhelming in terms of where do you start. So how do we start to demystify, perhaps even break down the barriers of a, of a phobia about the data and how 
we use it, you know, where do we start? What's the process? Who do we need to talk to? What skills do we need? Can you just kind of draw a picture? Because I'm sure this is part and parcel of your legal technologist job. Draw the picture to how we kind of just start getting a handle on all of this. Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, I'm a data file um, and, and I like to share. I'm enthusiastic about data, but do appreciate that there are some data phobes out there as well. <laughs> and, and I think probably the best advice I can give as to how you demystify data and how you start is by saying what data isn't. Mm. And so if you're starting from zero, data isn't a science. Uh, it isn't maths. It possibly isn't even Excel to start with. Um, what data is, it's effectively really, really good feedback. Mm. And so if you have 100 clients and 100 clients tell you your website is crap or your newsletter is rubbish mm. or um, it's impossible to navigate and I can't find the phone number I'm looking for, if someone told you that to your face, you would absolutely mm. go and action that. Um, that's an actionable insight. I'm going to take that. I'm going to go revise my website. I'm going to go revise my newsletter. Um, but essentially, people are already telling you that, and it's in data. And you don't even need to be a data. Google Analytics, for example, does a very good job of making that quite digestible, easy to understand. I can look at this. What does it mean? Um, you, it, by all means, at advanced levels, we can go into Power BI and detailed analytics and, and solving simultaneous equations and um, various different things at a much more advanced level. But at a basic level, it, it's essentially feedback. I'd then probably also say to have a think about, um, I find a really helpful distinction, the distinction between legal operations on one hand and legal services on the other. So legal operations being the meta work, um, billing, time recording, websites, newsletters, client development, those sorts of things. Um, and legal services, the actual ability to provide legal advice. And intuitively, legal operations data makes a lot more sense. Um, but obviously, from a lawyer perspective, there is actually legal services data as well. And so I quite often point to um, things like, well, um, in, in data, I should also say can be quantitative numbers and qualitative. And so if you imagine your templates and precedents folder is a folder full of things that might be useful one day. If the only data you've got as to whether to open one or not is the name of the file, that's not very good data. It's quite a lot of work to find the template or the precedent you're looking for, much less if they're scattered through a lot of different files. And so something simple like a knowledge base of my most commonly used precedents and templates, um, it's data that's in your head. You know the ones that you most commonly access. And if, it's an, and if all you're doing is to action that data is to make them easier to find, that's a fantastic outcome. Hmm. If you want to go further and say, oh, I can drill down into my templates, and I know I always have to amend clause 22, well, actually, maybe that's a um, uh, something I need to update in my templates. And finally, just on the, the legal services point, um, fundamentally, I tend to take the view that, that you know, legal services is just a form of, of, of risk management. And so one of my best outcomes um, for, for a particular client, I was given a brief of, we want to make out, we want to be the easiest person to contract with, but we don't want any legal risk. Mm. We don't want this to go wrong. It's kind of, oh, well, you know, it's a bit hard. You know, I want all my shopping in one bag and I don't want the bag to be heavy. But we sat down and we looked at it and we looked at their data and we actually figured out that we'll look about one in 20 of our contracts go wrong. And so I put it to them, well, do we put your prices up 5% and just accept the legal risk, we can make your template short and to the point? Or um, do you want these eight pages to try and deal with every bit of legal risk? And I can't actually guarantee one in 20 aren't going wrong anyway. That became a really easy discussion with my client around their risk appetite, which I was then able to action into a contract. And so very much lawyers can do really good things with a data mindset. Hey, I know what's important to me. I know what I need to find easier. I know what should be actioned with my clients. And so you don't need to sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and produce graphs, graphs and charts for that. Now, for some things, that makes sense. If you're dealing with quantitative legal operations data, you may need to do some of that. But if you're starting from nowhere and you need to start demystifying, well, what does data mean to me? Um, 
lawyers want a lawyer so it may be easier to start with the legal services side of things mm -hmm. um and that's certainly a recommendation I, I i make to people that are that are working with this um start with what you've already got or start with you know try and solve a problem uh it's th there's a uh startup aphorism that effectively everyone can name a brand of painkiller but very few people can name a brand of vitamin Mm -hmm. um, start, fix your problems as opposed to try and add, you know, a gloss of value add somewhere. Yeah. Do, do the problems, Matt, though, kind of come in broad categories? So you spoke about the legal um, service delivery, which is probably that part that is most closely connected to clients. Is there another category of data that falls into kind of like the business decision making? And, I, and, and I'm thinking here, obviously the one that tends to pop up all the time is around billing, but there's a whole much, there's a whole bunch more than that. So do, do you, and what I'm trying to get at is here, how do you start building an architecture in a way that, that helps you? Do you have to start with the categories? Like what, where do you start with all of that? Um, so so I, I'm big on data. I like to produce charts. I'm a big fan of matrix charts. And so I tend to, my starting analysis with a lot of my clients is uh, a continuum on the x-axis, a continuum on the y-axis. And left to right, we've got legal operations at one end, legal services at the other. Up and down, you've got client facing down to lawyer facing. And so for example, an example of a legal operations client facing tool is the time recording tool. That's how I enter time. Um, you can get some data about the tool. Does the tool work? How hard is it to, 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 to use or enter? But then clearly that then turns into a client-facing um, legal operations component when the client is reviewing the bill. And, you know, is that data meaningful in some of those things? So you can actually do data about data. You can chart things on a graph. You can identify... Um, you can identify categories of data, but certainly what I've found is that's a useful exercise to go through to help you figure out your pain points and to try and map solutions onto those pain points. But every practice is different. You know, a, a, a big law firm is going to have very different needs from a, you know, a, a smaller firm and a smaller firm dealing with, hey, I deal with, you know, 100 retail clients is going to be very different from a firm that deals with, a small firm that deals with two major clients is different again to an in-house team and a small organization versus an in-house team and a big organization. So the categorization exercise is important, mm. but it is something that I'd say you need to do yourself as part of your, um, whether you want to call it problem identification, needs analysis, where am I going to start? Hey, these are my real pain points. Mm. Um, that's an exercise to go through. It's a journey, not a destination. It's not something I can give you a set of ready-made categories and just say, put a tick in each one of these and you'll be fine. I, I think there's a lot of people looking for those ready-made categories, but Denise, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so to demystify data, I think you've got to think of data as simply as information it, it is what it is. And I would agree with Matt in that when you want to start using data, you want to ask the question, what are the questions I want my data to answer? Because you need to be clear on where you want to go with your data. Where do you want your data to take you? What are the questions that you want it to answer? And then that would be the first step. And then the second step would be, what data do I currently have to answer those questions? And then what data do I need to answer those questions? Mm -hmm. And then once you start to understand what information your data is telling you, you can then think, okay, well, have I answered the question or do I need to get more data? Or is my question now different to the question that I started with? Because again, I agree with Matt, it's a, it's a journey when you're on your data journey. You know, you're not going to create um, mind blowing dashboards on day one that are gonna salt, you know, dramatically change the organization it's a destination you're going to make changes to your metrics and you're going to make changes to how you measure things and, and and whatnot and i think that if that's how you start that will give you a good foundation for creating your dashboards and then creating your reporting and your metrics yeah absolutely 
David, I want to come to you and ask you the same question, but also pick up one of the questions that we've got from the audience here as well, which is um, right on point, which is how do you connect the dots between the data you're supposed to have and what you do with it? And I guess where the answer to that is we'll start with understanding the problem. But um, with response to that and other thoughts on this question, over to you. Thanks, Terry. Um, so I should say I 100% agree with, with, with Matt and Denise that the, the place that it, it's critical to start with the question that you want an answer to um, rather than the data. I think um, data itself, just by itself in an Excel spreadsheet, is to an extent completely useless um, because the data, data itself, you don't get any value from that. You get value through your interpretation of the data to answer a particular question or to, to address a particular problem. And I think it's um, really important to work work backwards. It's it's kind of similar to um, practicing as a lawyer, looking at a, a legal problem and and working your way through it. But you look look at the questions that we want to answer for a particular matter, and then you break it down into the, um, the logical components of well, what what's what say for example. Um, or, you know, breaking it down into its logical components and then looking at, well, what materials do I need to answer the questions that eventually get me to where I want to be? Mm. Um, and I think it's really important to start with the question, A, because then you know you, you're going to end up in the right spot. Um, you, you, it's actually going to be useful. Um, data, you can use data to tell pretty much any story that you want. Um, you can use data to create a, a a bevy of wonderful dashboards that no one will ever use. Um, and also, if you don't start with the question, that there's a big risk of um, either interpret, in, interpreting data in a unuseful way, um, and you can, I think you can actually cause a lot of problems and cr create a lot of damage if you um, misuse data. So you, mm. you, you need, need to start with the problem. And it, also, if you start with your data, you're starting from the assumption that your data is good data. Mm. Um, and it may not, in fact, be good data um, because you didn't didn't have in your head the question that you start um, mm. at the end. So, say for example, at, at, at Apton we went through a process last year where we um, overhauled our practice management system, and with a, a particular drive to starting to pull a lot more data and collect a lot more data, um, because as I say, law firms hoover up a huge amount of information, but part of the problem is that a lot of it's in an unstructured format. So, for example, pleadings, etc. Um, lawyers are great at great at doing that, but they're not good at, um, well, that's not structured data, so you need to structure it in a way to be able to draw insights out of it. Um, so the process we went through internally is I sat down with, um, say, broke everyone into groups. So I got the management group together, I got the finance group together, the lawyer group together, and basically just said, well, what, what questions do you wish you had an answer to? What questions do you, do you want to know the answer to? And to be honest, particularly with the lawyers, quite often it was a, a few very basic things and then they ran out of ideas um, very quickly. I think there's probably a little bit of a lack of imagination into what you can pull out, at which point the solution was, here's a pad and pen, sit it on your desk for the next week, and each time you have a question, um, go for it. And then once you've got your question, then work backwards in terms of, well, what information do I need to get to answer that question? And then where do I already have that information? Um, if not, where can I get the information? Um, so I think it's really important to, to work backwards through that process. Yeah. Absolutely. In terms of um, other tips in getting started and demystifying, I suppose one piece of advice would be start small, um, mm. start very small, start with a, a simple question and, and, and see how you can go. Um, and two, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's possible, not everyone has this option, but if it's possible, I um, would strongly recommend bringing in um, the, say, for example, in law firms, people that aren't, aren't the practitioners, people that don't have the, the practice background. So I think it's interesting that the areas where law firms are really good at collecting data and using data are the areas that the lawyers aren't running. Mm. It's typically where it's the other business professionals um, are bringing that sort of um, knowledge and that sort of skill set. So um, I think it's important to, to use them where we can. Yeah. Let, let me put this, uh, another question from our audience, so put this to all of you because it's a fair one and it speaks to the points that you've all been making. Um, and it's this, Google Analytics gives lots of great data, but I feel like I need a PhD in data analytics to understand what I'm looking at. And I guess I would take that uh, question kind of broader to all of you, is that 
how do you get, if you're a person sitting in a law firm or a legal department now, you can pull a bunch of analytics from a bunch of different places fairly easily. It's constructed for you. But, but again and again, keeping that kind of what problem are you trying to answer in mind, you've got that in mind, but there's all of this stuff. What do you do with this? I mean, do you need to bring in one of you folks to start making sense of it? I, um, I, I, I empathise and sympathise with yeah. this because, you know, some of the stuff that, that you see, it's just not particularly helpful. You don't know what to do with it. Yeah, and I guess for me, and I'll just build on what, David said, you know, mm. what question are you trying to answer? Well, if you don't know what question you're trying to answer, answer this question. Is this a good use of my time? Right. And whether that's I'm wasting time mucking around with emails, trying to find documents I'm looking for, writing newsletters, updating websites, is this a good use of my time? And fundamentally with that question in mind, that helps you look at a lot of aspects of data because Google Analytics does have a lot of information in it, but um, in my experience, and particularly if you're in attending a session about demystifying data, you're probably not already a data scientist. You should be the ones presenting this. Um, a, a lot of the time you're looking for the data is, well, what does this data tell me about? Is this or isn't this a good use of my time? And if you can see, for example, things like, well, not very many people spend a lot of time on my website or not very many people open the newsletter. Um, and, and some of this will turn into, I think, one of the questions we've got coming up. Um, you know, it's, what's good and bad? Well, it, it's, you know, it can be hard to figure out for you, but there, there will be a lot, of, um, a, a lot of data in Google Analytics that's just not relevant to a law practice. You know, mm -hmm. things about stickiness and how much time and returning stuff and abandoned shopping carts. Fundamentally, lawyers don't really transact via their website or e-commerce or anything along those lines mm. but it's very much a, um, I've written an article is anyone reading it no nope, I need to write my articles differently mm. I wrote an article this way and people are constantly coming back to it well I'm going to write my article again that way mm. and so if you look at the data thinking is this bit of data going to tell me whether this is a good use of my time or not and if it's not just move on to the next data point um, because there will be some data points in there that are helpful for, are helpful for that. Mm. Fundamentally, we sell time, we exchange time for money, and you're trying to really hone in on the, what's a good use of my time, what's a bad use of my time, what could be a better use of my time. Mm. Let me stay with you for a sec, Matt, and pick up from what you've just said, um, and just talk a little bit about this connection between data and metrics, which, you know, in effect, effectively what you, you were really referring to and I guess the question is this um, how are they connected why are they connected is it important that they're connected I mean at the end of the day presumably you're analyzing all of this stuff to lead you somewhere to tell you something in a story that mm -hmm. is helpful so tell us a little bit about that connection between data and metrics and, and David and Denise I want to come to you on this point as well Okay. Um, now, I'm not a data scientist, and so I may well use these words in a slightly less than <laughs> perfectly accurate terminology. Um, but let me use some examples of what I think of these things. Um, a data point, a piece of data, it took two days to answer this query. That's, that's data. Mm. And or four days to answer that query, two days to answer this. That's, that, to me, is data. Um, a statistic is I can see that, well, 40 out of 50 of these queries were answered within a week. Um, and so on its own, data tells us something, but it's not any kind of good or bad. Um, a metric would be an indication of, of how you're performing. What do those statistics mean? And so if you set a metric that I want, at, a, a query answered on time is a query answered within whatever it happens to be. For some, it might be a day. For some, it might be a week. For others, it might be a month. It depends on your practice. Mm. But you can then um, turn that statistic into something meaningful by using a metric. So how long should it take me to answer a query? How are we tracking against that? that that's a metric. Mm. And which is not to downplay the importance of statistics because these are, these are it's all data being used for different things. And where I find most useful is to think about the past, the present, and the future of my legal practice. 
And where metrics are most useful is in the present. Um, what is the state of my firm right now? What's my heads up report? What's the dashboard? What do I need to know today? And that might be, are we responding to queries on time? Who are the new clients that have come in this week? Who's got too much work on? Who doesn't have enough work on? Those are all things that work very well with metrics. But things that happened in the past can be equally important. And those are where sort of, let's say, statistics comes into its own. And, and certainly one of the use cases I frequently point out, I can see over the last year, every three months, the number of privacy queries we've had has doubled. Mm. I don't have a good or a bad number of privacy queries. There's no metric to track that. But I can see this is getting a more and more important part of my business. That's actually then becomes a future looking action point to say, hey, um, I need to hire another privacy lawyer because if this trend continues, I'm going to have too much work for the current team. Mm. Um, and then obviously the future focus point is how do you, it, what are the decisions you make from the information available to you to future proof your practice? Do you want to move into that? Do you actually want to say, you know, a combination of statistics and metrics, this type of work is a real headache. We don't make much money off it. Everyone hates it. I'm going to deliberately exit that, that business line or, you know, the exact opposite. And so um, people do get hung up on metrics. Metrics is a bit of a buzzword. Dashboards is a bit of a buzzword. Heads up reporting is a buzzword. And I use all these buzzwords, don't get me wrong. But they are different things for different um, applications, horses for courses. And so don't discount the value of statistics, but statistics tends to be useful in more, you know, historical trends. How do we predict that into the future? Metrics is far more, what's the health of my business right now? So I'm going to have a go at putting this cadence together and then you're going to tell me, all of you, whether I got this wrong or right. So I've ident I identify my problem, look for the data that might help inform me about that one way or the other, and my metrics are going to be what I'm going to use to be able to monitor and measure whether or not I'm actually responding to in some way, whatever that way is that you choose, um, to the problem that I've identified. How does that how does that sound? Denise and David, let me ask you, did I get that right? Getting good marks for that or bad marks for that? What's my metric for that? <laughs> 100%. I think you definitely nailed what the connection between data and metrics is. is Data is giving you information about how your business is performing. You have, you have specific questions around how your business, I want to know what my client satisfaction rate is. So I want to pull information that's going to tell me what my current satisfaction is. And once I baseline that satisfaction, um, I might then want to say, okay, well, over the next 12 months, I want to improve it. And then that becomes my metrics. Mm -hmm. So it might be at 50% satisfaction today. In 12 months, I want to be at 95%. How am I going to get there? You come up with actions to in, enhance your client customer satisfaction, but then you use your data and that metric to measure how you're performing against the goal of reaching 95% customer satisfaction. And David, does that change much if we're looking at it as kind of a, as a matter management tool as well or similar? I, I, I think it's similar. I think, um, I suppose in, in those three things of the, the question, the data and the metric, I'd probably put the, the metric in between the, the question and the data. Um, I mean, in, our, in an ideal world, our data would directly answer the question we're trying to ask, but we all have a habit of asking really complicated questions that don't necessarily have a um, direct and easy answer. So I suppose um, in terms of metrics, statistics, those sorts of things, the way I, I view them is it's a way of interpreting the data. So you can then figure out the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So it's an indi indicator, say, for example, um, in terms of well, any metric, really. Um, you look at it and you it's an indicator, it's a flag, it's a data point um, that you can then use to uh, answer the question that you're, you're looking for. And I think from a, a matter management perspective, um, in, even in terms of substantive legal practice, I think it's um, much for much really in terms of, uh, of how it applies. Mm. Um, in, in terms of metrics though, I, I think one, one important thing to add is, as I say, it's a, it's a way of interpreting the data. 
it's not an answer to the question itself. I think people sometimes run into trouble where they look at a metric and think, well, that that's all the information I need to know. I typically encourage people to think of it as it's an indicator or point you in the right direction of the question, but it won't necessarily answer it. So it's important to, I suppose, apply some inter intellectual rigor around what the sure. metric, what, what, what the statistics are telling you. Um, and anyone looking into metrics, particularly when it comes to measuring performance or tracking performance, um, would very highly recommend looking at the book, The, the, the Tyranny of Metrics, um, because it's important when, particularly those working, say, in our space where we're designing um, metrics, we're designing dashboards, those sorts of things, it, it's important to remember, I suppose, the human element involved in that A, um, everyone will bring their own their own personal views, they'll bring their own interpretation to it. So two people can read the same metric and, and potentially interpret it in slightly different ways. Hmm. Um, and it's kind of the, the, the uncertainty principle or the, um, as soon as you measure something, you have a habit of influencing behaviours. So I, over the weekend, I recently took my car in to get serviced um, at Mitsubishi. And ever since I've been getting phone calls every two days saying, how is the service? Great, it, it's a 10 out of 10, can you fill out this survey? Hmm. Um, so because I presume Mitsubishi has a metric of kind of like an NPS or out of 10, what's the score, the business is now putting resources into having someone call up specifically for me to return a 10 or mm. um, slightly more nefariously in the States, there's research to show that they started um, measuring things like um, someone after surgery say, what's the mortality rate of someone who went through a surgery within 30 days of checking out of the hospital? Um, and they found that that led certain doctors to start turning patients away and declining to treat them because they didn't want to ruin their metrics. Hmm. Um, so I, I think it's really important to think about those sorts of things as well when we're designing or trying to um, interpret the, these sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. Denise, I want to ask this question of you because we... Uh, and and really, um, again, something that you're very close to. But we've we've seen the rise of the legal ops function, particularly in in-house legal departments, very significantly, albeit differently in different parts of the world, but very significantly nonetheless. And um, obviously, a, a, a crucial part of that role, as we've identified, is the use and application of data. Um, we also spoke at the beginning about the fact that. The, the the use and application of data hasn't been as widespread in law firms, certainly not on a on a comparative basis. So do you think there's a gap emerging in how and where data is used in law firms and in-house? And what's the impact of um, what your response might be to that question as well? So I think there is a gap in how law firms and in-house teams are using data. Based on the research that I did um, and from my own personal experience, I think the in-house teams are far are more advanced in their use of data and, and analytics. And I would say that that could be a contribution because being in an organization, you're in an organization with other departments. So you've got human resources, you've got finance, you've got technology, you've got business, who are you who are have been on a journey of using data to, to drive how they run their, their business units within the organization. And legal are starting to or have started to jump onto that bandwagon. And they're able to do that because they're implementing legal technologies that are capturing data for them that are helping them to put the information together to understand how their teams are, are um, performing. And I think as a result of that, um, the in-house teams are becoming more savvy with their data and their expectation of their, ex their firms is becoming higher. So they are looking at their firms to give them more information and data around how they are using their firm so that they can then make use that data to make decisions. Mm. So, um, Whilst I think there is a gap, uh, I, I would say that definitely the in-house teams are, are, are slightly more advanced. And from what I've seen, the firms are getting on board and, and saying, yes, we've, we've got to start using our data to help our, our in-house teams make decisions. Mm. Um, and as a, 
I think as, as a result of that, it's, it's, you know, legal technology and then the organization structures in themselves, how organizations are structured today have contributed to that because mm -hmm. both finance and HR have, have been on a technology journey a little bit longer than, than legal has been. Mm -hmm. Matt, just want to ask you that question as well. I mean, does it, does it matter or why does it matter if law firms and uh, in-house, and I guess particularly if they're working with in-house clients, um, are not kind of in a level playing field in terms of their data usage and application? Well, well look, there's a lot of different ways of slicing and dicing this, but yep. let's talk about bills, because when people say legal data, they often think about bills. Yeah. Um, we are in an age of doing more with less. Uh, unfortunately, the accountants have toppled the lawyers, the accountants are in charge, um, and lawyers are undoubtedly seen as a cost center. Um, do you really need all those lawyers? We haven't even been sued for five years. Um, and the in-house team is in, is in the sites, much less the external law firms, because, you know, look, let's face it, you know, lawyers are a grudge purchase. You only mm. pay for legal services because you have to. No one wakes up in the morning and says, yes, I get to go and buy a new lawyer today. I love them, um, Matt. <laughs> and, and we do appreciate it, Terry. But um, um, uh, so, as I say, law lawyers are a grudge purchase. And so to move from that dynamic of how do we turn ourselves into a cost center into how do we demonstrate value? And so... For law firms, at least, one of the big things I certainly urge my in-house clients and my law firm clients to do is you get, you're get getting all this data. How can you use it a bit better to demonstrate you're adding value as opposed to here's a bill, $5,000, please. That's mm -hmm. a cost center. Your investment was $5,000 last month. For that, we managed to settle this case for $10,000 instead of the claimed $50,000. That's a $40,000 saving. And that data exists even if it's only in the partner the partner's head writing the narrations to go on the bill now you can systematize it much more but effectively what i guess i'd encourage is um it, i agree with denise that in-house teams are getting more sophisticated all the time and a lot of the you know legal tech vendors are selling stuff to in-house teams one of the ways they sell stuff to in-house teams is we can optimize your legal spend um, it'll pay for itself. That's a, you know, that's a great story. But that's coming out of the law firm's pockets, ultimately. Mm. Um, and so there is a disjunct. But even if there isn't a disjunct between the law firm and the in-house team, there's definitely a disjunct between the law firm billing department and the, in, the, the organization's finance department, who are increasingly tightening the, tightening the belts and saying, look, you need to demonstrate how you're providing value here. Mm. And so again, for, for people that are just starting out on their journey, certainly one of the things I would encourage people to look at is how can you move towards, um, how can I use this data to demonstrate value as opposed to how can I use this data to issue a bill for a dollar amount? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, we are, we are drawing to a close, but I wanted to wrap by getting the thoughts of all of you um, on this last question I'd like to put to you. You know, the title today was um, basically, can we really create a data-driven legal practice? Is, is, it, is that a fact? Is it fiction? Is it fantasy? And David, I wanted to put this question to you, kind of um, looking ahead, and, and if you like, you can tell me how far you want to look ahead, um, and looking at legal organisations, so taking the broad definition of that, what happens if we don't embrace data? Um, thanks, Terry. I, I'll start by saying I think it's definitely definitely possible. I think, again, lawyers are sitting on a, a giant pool of data. It's just about wrangling it, structuring it, and pulling something useful out of it. Um, and going back a little bit to the, the, the in-house um, private practice, um, it, it, the, the longer we go down this route, the, the more it might start again to shift the balance between what's in-house and what, what's private practice. And, and I suppose I, I come to the, the concept of practice area and complexity, but data, particularly when you're looking at the more substantive things, say, for example, of a particular type of matter, what's the typical outcome range or what's the typical settlement range, the more and more data that we get for that, um, the less and less risk 
involved in making a call on that. And the more that might, that sort of work might shift, you know, in house, it might have they have a higher risk tolerance because they're relying on a backing of data, or it might push it further down the chain. So it's not necessarily the partner coming up with that that opinion that it's moving down. So I, I think a there's a lot of use that we can get out of that, um, and b I think it it will start to impact, particularly in the I suppose the more again from a litigation point of view, the um, lower value, high volume, or the the less complex areas. Um, unfortunately, as a lawyer, I'm a bit of a cynic in that, um, particularly towards the more bet the business type um, litigation, I think the, the entire, I mean, the, the entire foundation of law is kind of based around um, opinion and discretion. And um, no, no matter how much data you've got, I think there'll always be a place for, you know, we need an opinion from Alan Archibald because he is the, the top barrister. Mm. Um, so I think there will be there'll be some organisations that really embrace it. I think at the um, more transactional end of the litigation market, I think they'll have a lot of pressure to and they'll have to. There'll be some um, of the, I suppose, larger firms or the more bespoke firms who will embrace it and will get a lot of value out of it. But there'll be a lot of firms that I, I think will focus on it for billing purposes and, and gather a whole bunch of data around that. They won't pick it up in terms of the practice and they'll leave a lot of value on the table, but I think they'll they'll survive. Okay, Matt, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, again, being you know maybe a little bit provocative, I think uh, those that don't embrace data will have their backsides handed to them by those that do. And uh, whether that's newer, more nimble firms, whether that's alternative legal service providers, online providers, AI, the big four, um, they're all gunning for their legal spend. Mm. Um, and if you can do it smarter, quicker, for less, what what's a traditional law firm got going for it? Mm. And don't get me wrong, there are undoubtedly some things that will always need to be done by you know the top QC in the country. Mm. But if you're not that top QC, where where's your work coming from? And so yeah. it's it really is um, uh, cannibalism is coming you want to be the first to the table. And you want to know it's coming, uh, I think is the other point, isn't it? Denise, we started with you. So um, coming full circle, your thoughts to, to wrap us up? Uh, I definitely agree with both David and, and Matt in that organisations will need to either embrace data and use their data to, to drive their business or they won't exist. You know, you think about a blockbuster and how Netflix approached them to, to do a partnership and they said, no, videos are the way, you know, videos are the future. Yeah, no. Uh, and which one exists today? So I think that um, both law firms and in-house teams will continue to drive the use of their data and, and how they run their business and use the data because legal technology, they'll continue to implement legal technologies that will give them different types of data. They'll still have questions that they'll need to answer. They'll, they'll want to do uh, reporting on, how, on their performance. And the only way that they're going to be able to do that effectively is to use data. Mm -hmm. And in order to exist, I think they'll need to jump on the data train to, get to, to exist in the future. So lots of opportunities ahead, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say there. Um, thank you very much, Denise, Matt and David. Really appreciate your time today. Great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for attending and for your questions as well. Really appreciate that. This session will be available as a video and a podcast shortly, so you can jump in and listen again or share it with colleagues as the case may be. If you want to connect with any of the amazing faculty here today, I know that you can find them all on LinkedIn and they would be more than happy to connect with you there. They're also on lots of other social media sites, as are we, so feel free to connect um, with us then as well. So again, folks, thank you very much. And to everyone, see you next time. Bye.